Hello, everyone. All right, make sure you have your King Arthur book with you and make sure you have a pencil, a highlighter as we go through chapter four of book two, which is about Tristram and the fair Isuelt. So there are a lot of names in this one. I got to keep myself straight. So the chapter starts off and of course, all the knights have gathered again at Pentecost and they're talking about these two sieges, which remember are seats at the round table. And so you have the Siege Perilous, and then you have Gowan on one side and Lancelot on the other, and then you have an empty siege and an empty siege on either side of those two. And everybody at the round table knows that those five sieges, Lancelot, Gowan, the Siege Perilous, and the two empty ones beside it, are the most, I'm not going to say most important knights, but the best knights that will ever be in Camelot. So those two on the other side of Gowan and Lancelot have been empty all this time. And so King Arthur's just wondering, like, who in the world is going to come sit there? Is anyone coming soon? Like, what is happening? So Gowan said, you know, I heard of a guy from Cornwall, and his name is Tristram, and he's one of the best knights there are. And Lancelot said, you know what? I fought that guy. He's great. Maybe that's him. Remember Merlin said something about that? So King Arthur said, send someone to Cornwall and ask him if he will come to the round table. And so someone goes off. And about that time, they start to hear this music coming from outside. And it's, they said it was beautiful. And it was sad music. And finally, they called him a minstrel, which is basically just a musician. But the minstrel comes in and starts talking to King Arthur. And he's like, where are you from? And he goes, I'm from Cornwall. And King Arthur's like, what? We were just talking about this guy from Cornwall. Do you know Tristram? Like, have you heard of him? And he goes, yeah, I see him all the time. And he said, let me tell you the story of Tristram. And on page 169, I wrote, story of Tristram begins, and it ends, he's still telling the story, telling the story, telling the story, telling the story. The oh, wrong way. end of the story is on page 186. So from 169 to 186, Every word on these pages is what the minstrel is telling King Arthur. So it's not really happening in real time, right? He's like telling a story of what he knows about Tristram. So he begins by talking about Tristram's parents. And so uh, there was a king named Rivalin, and it was worded really strangely. It almost seemed like when it said the land of Rivalin, like it was the name of the town, but it was not. That was the name of the king. So Rivalin and his wife, and it said they were living, you know, their best life. Everything was great until Morgan the Wicked came in and attacked him and killed Rivalin. Now, I've already put King Rivalin right here. He's dead. The first, but not the last, that we will put up today. So page 169, King Rivalin is killed. And the wife runs out into the woods with her um, trusted friend, Rule someone who had, you know, was very well trusted in the, um, she called him a faith keeper, right? Um, someone in the, in the royal town that was very trusted to her. So he ran out with her. She runs out into the woods and I guess she had been pregnant because she has a baby and she's in distress and she is about to die. And she says to rule this trusted friend, I want you to take the baby. I want you to name him Tristram because he's born in sorrow. And I want you to raise him like he's your own because I'm going to die. And when he is old enough, when he's an adult, I want you to tell him that my brother, his uncle is King Mark of Cornwall and tell him to go to King Mark and tell King Mark that he needs help to basically avenge our death and attack Morgan the Wicked. So that's her instructions, and then she dies. Why didn't I do a thing for her? Hold on. Okay, so I guess they didn't give her a name, but I'm going to put her up there anyway because it's Tristram's mama, right? So let's put her beside her husband. 
So Romeo and Juliet. And not the last Romeo and Juliet we're going to see in this chapter. I just called her queen of Rivelin, not a town, but a man, right? So she dies on page 170. And Rule and his wife take the baby and they raise him to be a wonderful person. They teach him how to play music and how to play chess and how to speak all these different languages. And he turns out to just be a really great person. And when he's a little bit older, um, they go to town one day and there's this boat from Norway that had been docked. And the people, the sailors are talking to Rule and then they start talking to Tristram. And one of them invites Tristram onto the boat to play chess. And he's great at chess, so he goes on the boat and he's winning all the games. And he doesn't know that they've decided they're going to take him and sell him into slavery and make a little money. And so they've secretly pulled the anchor and gone off to sea and he doesn't even know it. So obviously he finally figures it out and then a storm comes up and it's just tossing them and turning them and they all decide it was very Jonah. It was very Jonah and the whale. They decide this is happening because we've been cursed, but not cursed by Tristram's bad deeds, but cursed by our own bad deeds. We gotta get rid of him and not sell him and then the storm will stop. So they pull into the closest land they can find, which happens to be Cornwall, where King Mark is. Now at this time, Tristram does not know that King Mark is his uncle, but he meets him. And even though they don't know they're related, they get along very well. And he soon becomes one of King Mark's most trusted advisors. Well, soon, Rule comes into town. He's looking for Tristram. Like the last time I saw him, he got on this boat. Where is he? And when he finds him, I love what he says here on page 171. Um, he Rule finds that Tristram is with King Mark and he says, it's kind of towards the bottom here, right here. He says, he found Tristram with King Mark and he saw that God had been working in these things. So he's like, the only way this could have happened was that God was working for good. And so... I kind of like that he gave the credit to God in that. And so he tells them, hey, by the way, I'm not really your biological father. Your sis, your mother was his sister. And so you guys are related. And they were both very happy. And Tristram ends up staying with King Mark and he is a knight and he's going off on battles and he actually goes and um, kills Sir Morgan. Is that his name? Yes, Morgan the Wicked. He killed him. All right, so we're going to put Morgan the Wicked. Let's put him way far away from King Rivelin. Out of respect, because he killed them. Well, he killed him. She died after having, I guess Tristram kind of killed her, but let's don't go there. All right, so. He gives actually the reign over Lioness to rule his adoptive father. And he puts it really under Mark's umbrella. So Mark is still really the ruler, but in that town, rule is the ruler. So then one day, um, he comes into the court. Tristram comes into Sir Mark's court, King Mark's court, and he sees this guy named Sir Morhalt of Ireland. And he is there to demand a tribute. And I'm sure you remember when we were talking about um, Native Americans, the Aztecs were big into this, going around to different tribes and demanding tribute or payment, you know, just to survive. You just have to pay me because you're alive. Like not for anything in particular, that's a tribute. So he comes in demanding a tribute and what he wants is not even money. It's 30 boys that are of some kind of royal descent some kind of noble birth. And so he walks in and this man is saying, this is what I want. And either you can give me these 30 boys or one of your knights has to fight me. And all the knights are like, I'm not fighting him. I'm not fighting him. So Tristram comes in and he's kind of mad, like no one's going to fight. And so he says, okay, fine, I will fight. And so the duel happens between Morhalt and Tristram. 
And as they're fighting, Tristram gets a wound in his thigh. And um, on page 173, he is told by Marhalt that says, For upon my sword is a magic ointment. There are few indeed who can heal the wound into which it comes. And that just makes Tristram mad that he's been hit by this sword that's got some kind of magic on it. And so he attacks ferociously and he ends up stabbing him in the head. And part of his sword actually chips off into Marhalt's head. Now Marhalt's not technically dead at that point, but he does go on um, the boat. They take him back towards Ireland and he does end up dying. So on page 173, we see the death of Sir Marhalt of Ireland. Let's sit in over here. So he dies on the way back home. When this body gets back there, his sister, who's going to be super important going forward, her name is Isode, who's going to be the mother of Isult, but Isode, she is mad that someone has killed him and she knows it's someone in Cornwall and she actually digs the chip of the sword out of his wound out of his head and she keeps it and she vows that she's going to get vengeance on this person that has killed her brother and we all know who that person is it's Tristram but she doesn't know that so Tristram was sick I mean remember he has the wound it's something that probably cannot be healed by just anyone and it just won't heal and it won't heal and it won't heal. And so finally, some people in town say, listen, the only way that's going to get healed is if you go to Ireland, because that's where the magic was from. You have to go there. And he knows that the person that probably will be able to heal him is Queen Isode. Now, this is tricky, right? He's the one who killed the brother. So when he gets there, he's like better disguise myself. And I just love the name he came up with. Tramtris. So like he took the end of his name and he stuck it on the beginning of his name. So Tristram becomes Tramtris. And he's a musician and he goes in and he kind of, you know, makes her a fan of his just by that. And she gladly heals him of this wound that he says is gotten by pirates. And um, she ends up or her husband actually ends up asking him to stay so that he can teach their daughter, Isult, how to play the harp. And so he ends up staying for an entire year. And, you know, he thinks that Isult is pretty and he kind of likes her, but it says he doesn't try to woo her. So he doesn't try to, like, ask her out on a date or anything like that, but he does think she's pretty. Um, so her father, King German, um, is happy with what has happened and everyone parts with, you know, happy thoughts. And he goes, Tristram leaves, Tramtris, Tristram, same guy. He leaves and he goes back to King Mark. And when he gets there, they're talking and King Mark is like, you know what? I kind of need to get married, right? Because I need to have some heirs to the throne. And so he's like, I kind of like Isil. Is she a nice girl? And, you know, of course, Tristram's like, yeah, she's a nice girl. But listen, she's not going to marry you. You're from Cornwall, right? They know that Marhalt was killed by someone from Cornwall. And so he goes, well, let me go, Tristram. Let me go back and see what I can do. So Tristram goes. And finally, finally, people, we get to see a dragon battle. Because when he gets back to Ireland, there's this dragon that's just torturing everyone in town. And so the king has said, any, any knight who can kill this dragon can have Isild as his wife. And so Tristram's like, this is easy. So he heads over to where the dragon is. And he actually, for the first time, encounters this seneschal. Now, that word you may remember from way early on. I want to say it was in the first chapter. We talked about the seneschal because... Sir Kay was going to be the seneschal. Um, it's like a trusted advisor, someone who's going to take care of your affairs. So this is the seneschal to the king, King German. And he is kind of following a group of knights that's going to fight the dragon. And then when he sees what's going on, he turns and runs away because he's really pretty, uh, how can I say, cowardice? 
I think that's a fair word. All right, so he sees this guy, but he goes ahead and he ends up fighting this dragon and he does kill it. But before he kills it, he gets some dragon poison in him. And so he has the thought, I don't know where this would come from, but I don't live in medieval times. So what do I know? He cut off the tongue of the dragon and he put it in his little pouch. And then he laid down. He didn't die, but it said it was as if he was dead. Right, it said on page 178, he fell down in a deep swoon and lay like one dead because of the poison, but he's not really dead. And then the seneschal comes along and he's like, what, the dragon's dead and that guy's dead, although he really wasn't dead, but he looked dead. And so the seneschal sees opportunity. I'm gonna say I killed the dragon. And so he cuts off the dragon's head these guys are awesome. And he brings the head with him and he goes to the king and he said, look, I killed the dragon. Now I get to marry Isyult, the fair. And so the king is, you know, maybe a little skeptical because he knows this guy. It's like, there's no way he killed the dragon, but how am I going to prove it? And so I love on the page of, on the bottom of page 178, Isyult finds out that she's going to have to marry the Seneschal, and she says, rather than marry him, I will slay myself. Like, I would rather die than have to marry that guy. So moving along, the mom says, listen, don't do that. Let's figure, see if we can figure out what really happened. So they go to the dragon, and they see the headless dragon, and they see, and they're like, oh, it's Trantris. No, it's Tristram, but you know, they know him as Tramtris. And so they scoop him up and they bring him back to the castle. And Iso does her magic again and she heals him up. And when he wakes up, he's like, Oh my gosh, here's what happened. I killed the dragon. And they're like, Hmm, the Seneschal said he killed the dragon. And he shows them the tongue. Okay, which is going to be a good piece of evidence. So moving along, there's going to be a battle because. The Seneschal says he killed the dragon. Tramtris says he killed the dragon. They're like, you got to fight it out. And so Tramtris or Tristram is going to have to fight the Seneschal. And um, they, even though he showed the tongue and the guy showed the head, people are like, I don't know. You just fight it out. And so here's where it gets, mm, I got real nervous for a minute because Isyult takes his sword because she's worried she's like oh no he's gonna have to fight and she likes him she doesn't like the seneschal she definitely wants Tramdris to win so she pulls out his sword and she sees the little chip and then she goes to where her mom had stored the little chip out of her uncle's head and she's like oh it fits together like a puzzle that's not good she goes directly to her mother and says, Tramtris is the guy who killed Uncle Morhalt. And they're like, the mom, she's very level-headed. So she said, let's go talk to him. And so they go, and he's very honest. He tells the whole story, why he disguised himself. He needed healing, whatever. I'm sorry, I killed him. And so they kind of make a bargain. And Isod sees that, and he even tells that he doesn't want Isyult for himself, he wants her to marry his uncle, King Mark of Cornwall. And so Isod sees how that would be a good thing for her daughter to marry a king. So she's like, okay, we can do, let's go ahead and do this. And um, on page 181, the battle goes down and the Seneschal dies. Now they never really tell us his name, but I just put, he's the Seneschal of King German. So let's put him here. He's dead. And so Tristram basically wins the hand of Isyult for her uncle, King Mark. Now, this seems like a happy ending, right? The twists and turns. So they get on the boat, Tristram, Isyult, and 
the Lady Brangwain. Oh, she goes down in history, right? The Lady Brangwain is like a um, helper to Isyold. And before they leave, the mother, Isode, gives Brangwain this flask, just a, you know, something that holds liquid, and says, do not lose this and do not let anyone drink it until the wedding day. Then you are to get Isyolt and King Mark to each drink out of the flask because it's a love potion. Now let's read about the love potion. It is on page 181, bottom of the page, for it is a love potion so strong that nothing in the world may undo its effects. I hope you've highlighted this part. So strong that once a man and a maiden have drunk of it together, they shall love one another even unto the world's end with a love greater than any in the world. Like there's no turning back once you have drunk of the flask. So she's like, it's your job, Lady Brangwain, to take care of this flask and make sure no one drinks it till the wedding day and that only Isyult and King Mark drink it because then they will live happily ever after, right? They'll love each other no matter what. Sounds good. What no one counted on was Lady Brangwain getting seasick and being locked up in a room for days because she just was so sick. And so one day, Isyult and, you know, um, Tr Tristram, who we can call Tristram again now, is, they're just hanging out. They're having a good time, whatever. And they see the flask. They're like, hey, guess what? We should drink that. Lady Brangwain will be so mad when she wakes up that we drink her wine. They just think it's regular wine. And so they each drink of it. And that is very bad. Because on the bottom of 183, straight away, strong love awoke in their hearts. And the world grew dim because of the light, which now shone about each of them in each other's eyes. So they just loved each other so strongly because they drank the potion. So when they get back, you know, this is kind of a complication. When they get back to Cornwall and King Mark wants to marry her, you know, it's like, what should we do? We, I don't, she's like, I don't love him. I love him. But they decide so nicely that if, those two kind of ran off together that Ireland and Cornwall would be bitter enemies forever. Like it would be a, a bit of a betrayal. So they decided the right thing to do was for her to marry King Mark. And she does. She doesn't love him, but she marries him. And then for years, it's like, you know, they just see each other now and again. And then they started to meet up kind of secretly because they just couldn't help it. Right. The love was so strong from the potion and King Mark, catches the wind of it. And he um, goes and he actually sees for himself that they're meeting up. And he's so mad. First, he says Tristram should be killed. And all the people that were his advisors said, no, you can't do that. Like, he's a great knight. You know, you can't do that. And he goes, okay. Then he is banished from here forever. And so he has to leave. And he can never come back. And so he leaves. And this is the point where he's, the minstrel stops telling the story. And King Arthur says, hey, how do you know so much about this guy? And he admits, I am Tristram. This guy who's been telling the story, who's basically telling his own life story. So everyone's like, what? There's a little murmur across the room. And so they're like, you know, you're, we know that you are the one who's supposed to be in one of these sieges. And as they're speaking, his name grows upon the siege. And he ends up sitting down. He's right beside Lancelot. And Lancelot is interesting, an interesting buddy here. Because remember, he's in love with Queen Guinevere, even though she's married to King Arthur. So he can totally understand what Tristram is going through, um, being in love with someone who's married to the king. So he ends up sitting beside Lancelot. That's his siege. And he goes on many quests. And he's a great knight. And he does many great things. And then at the very end, um, he gets hurt and he knows that the only person that can save him is Isyult. No, oh, I skipped an important part. He got married, right? He got married to 
another lady named Isult, because that's a common name. So Isult, his wife, was very jealous of Isult the Fair, right? The one that he really loved. But, you know, he was faithful to his wife, but he still didn't love her like he loved the other one. So he gets married. So then moving on, he gets hurt and he's about to die. He knows the only person that can save him is Isult the Fair because she has the same kind of powers that her mother had for healing. And so she asks for someone to go to her and say, will you come and will you heal him? And they do. And she says, of course. And the deal was, as the boat was coming towards him, if she had come, they were to put up a white flag. And if she had not come, they were to put up a black flag. And so he's so near death. And he asked his wife, Isyult, is there, can you see the boat? Yes, she can see the boat. Does it have a white flag or a black flag? And it had a white flag. And she said it had a black flag, which was a lie. And so he gives it up. And he just dies. Now, would he have lived if he'd known it was a white flag, that she was almost there? One could reckon that he would. But she lied to him and he died. And so then Isyult the Fair comes in to heal him and finds him dead. And on page 189, when, and when Isyult the Fair, Queen of Cornwall, found him dead, she knelt at his side until her heart broke for very sorrow. And she died also. And then... The other Isild, his wife, felt terrible about it, and she actually agreed to let them be buried together. And then this ro these roses were planted, and they intertwined, where one rose bush would have two different colors of roses, and it was a very beautiful, you know, um, kind of, I don't mean to compare them to dogs, but, oh, I shouldn't say that. Some of you haven't read that book. But anyway, this is a beautiful thing. They were buried together. So we have Tristram died probably because of the lie. Let's get his rope here. Let's see if this thing works. And then he was buried with Isult the Fair, not that other Isult. I should have drawn some pretty roses for their graves. Maybe I will. So our graveyard is growing, friends. That was a lot of people that died today. Okay, make sure that you've done your hashtags and make sure you've done your, you know, annotating marks, highlighted what's important, and you're keeping up with all of that, and that you're doing your notes in your journal. So we'll talk later. Bye.